Good day, good night, CFR Network, back working hard again in the lab. Shalom, balance, and paradise all. As you can see, I've got another special guest with me. <laughs> and I've kept it a lot more local again for this build and conversation. I have with me some feminine energy as well. Can't forget the uh, the, the sea stars. I've got uh, Marsha Garrett. Educator, community worker, activist, mother, and uh, everything in between. Welcome to the broadcast. And please do fill in the parts that I have, have um, missed out, young lady. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, parts that you've missed out. You've you've covered a you covered a lot there. But um, yeah, I my, I am an educator, researcher, and public speaker. Um, in anti-racist education, racism, colonialism, uh, and I do writing as well. So sometimes I write articles for newspapers, so on and so forth, all in that sort of field around dismantling white supremacy. Indeed. And firstly, thank you very much for um, taking time out of your busy schedule of being a mother and all of those various things and balls that you're juggling currently. So Thank you very much for your time. I'm, I'm honored to have you on the uh, the uh, broadcast and trustfully through this conversation and some of your um, your wise words and thoughts, um, we will incite um, some thought and possibly some change within people. Excellent, blessed and thank you for the invite to come on. You're most welcome. So before before we even get into the uh, the meat and the potato without any bones and the vegetables <laughs> and all the rest of it, Zombie Apocalypse 2020, we made it, and we've got to thank the Most High that we made it through. We're in the Gregorian year of 2021 now. How has all that? How have you seen your way through that year successfully, Marsha? Rah, that is um, it's such an excellent question because so much has happened um, at a time when we were kind of told to stand still. So I think that. I almost didn't have a chance to reflect fully on what happened in 2020. It was just responding uh, to the situation. And because of the work that I do, because I, I do run a community organization, we were thrown into um, like a crisis response because many of the people um, that we work with and that our service meets the needs of were struggling massively with um, access to food. And they don't, the majority do not earn enough to bulk buy. So whilst lots of people were bulk buying and you know cleaning out the, the shelves, um, the people that our organization supports were not able to do that because they literally live sort of week to week um, on whatever little money that they get. So they were having to do small uh, shops um, in local convenience stores. And some of those convenience stores were putting their prices up, um, meaning that they got less for their money. So we designed a food bank. Um, we'd never done one before. This is myself and my staff team. It's not me alone, okay. but we'd never done one before. And it just was huge in terms of demand, being humbled that we were able to do something, um, working in partnership with others because we did food deliveries initially. So we were taking food to people's houses, 100 people a week and providing cooked food as well. Wow. Um, rice and jerk chicken. So for that, for the whole of that year, um, I was very much involved in uh, doing the food bank. We're still running it now, because um, obviously the pandemic is is ongoing. Yes. And at the same time, um, we then saw and witnessed the murder of George Floyd in the US. And so, Marsha, before you even get into yeah. that detailed part, let me just rewind slightly. So yeah. that that situation which is brought on by the <clears throat> pardon self the pandemic and stuff and as you've highlighted you know a lot of people were shopping a lot more locally at their convenience stores and some of those independents did raise their prices and because we live in a capitalist society they are entitled to do that but it goes mm -hmm. within reason so we did have unscrupulous convenience stores and corner shops as we call them and they were taking liberties with this with the 
public who frequent and make their business viable by spending there regularly and you took it upon yourself to to do this so regarding the cooked meals elements like the the, the jerk chicken etc did you uh, do do that yourself or did you find an entity in a restaurant or a caterers who too could provide that service for you well, well, that's an excellent question. We are so blessed. Um, in my staff team, there's myself and two of the ladies who run our community organization. And one of the ladies has a particular interest in cooking, but she didn't have um, the food safety qualification. Mm -hmm. So once we were aware of what the need was in our community, which was just access to, to food. So we, we give out dry food parcels as well as cooked food. Mm -hmm. She did the qualification in one day. So she got her certificate and then we, we rolled with it the next week. So it's actually a lady that co we currently work with that does all of that cooking. She wow. gets up at 4 a.m. and makes that food for us. And people every don't week. understand the love and care it takes to, to, to prepare anything. It, it's not a case of just getting up and there's a lot of seasonings or, or, you know, depending on what type of food you cook and you just get that and do it. And it might be like a, an hour job. This is... A, a long period of time we're talking about three four hours at least to, to, to actually cook and prepare and and get this all ready to go exactly yeah so she would be cooking from 4 a.m till about i'd say about 9 a.m so we all took on different roles so she was the the um our our chef um then i was the the shopper so i would buy all the dry food and all the ingredients for the cooked food um and then parcel them up and then um, our other colleague she runs the building where we give the food parcels out and the cooked food out and she coordinates the volunteers mm -hmm. so we all just but it was it was strange because we just took we just went into those roles it was like this is what we need to do this is how we're going to do it and then we just did it yeah um you know I'm, I'm not undermining the level of work that goes into running a food bank um as well as you know you have to be cognizant of of what your people are, are eating so yes. um so to give an example uh, we went through a phase where we were buying the capsules for washing um because they were cheaper mm -hmm. um but then then we realized one that some of our clients our service users don't have a washing machine hand washing um, yes yeah so then it was a case of no we actually need to get liquid or powder mm -hmm. and it was working out cost you know which which was the better value for money so we could then get more for our money um same way that you know most of our service users rice is a staple in of their course. diet yes um so we can't provide meat because um meat is a great deal more costly and mm -hmm. also it's meeting you know halal or um keeping it fresh yes so what we thought we'd do is we would try to buy the staples so that they had money to get meat um and other necessities so to just to give an example one family that we were that start, started to use our service they were really in a position where they were deciding whether they could afford to buy nappies or medicine because uh, cow, cow poll is, is is not cheap you know it's mm. it's, it's five pounds um and if you're living on 32 pound a week you know five pounds is a big amount out of your money of course so if we can cover some of the staples we've got like things like nappies and wipes and things it just gives people that little bit little bit of space or you know flexibility to be able to buy those other things so that they're not debating you know do yeah. i get medicine so that my child feels better or or nappies you know it relieves the pressure and gives them that that clearer vision to be able to deal with the day and you know and raise their children ultimately yes and in our area um there's not many uh black-led organizations and the reason why I, I mentioned that is because when it was coming to um other food banks so some food banks you need to have a letter mm. um from the local authority so some people were um unable to access due to not having that letter the other thing is is that you know we were providing food that our people can eat yes. you know not not everybody um can honestly they can't stomach things like um spaghetti bolognese <laughs> and, and, and garlic bread you know some people can that's cool that's fine so their yeah. needs will be in but for our community you know rice and chicken and seasoning is a really important part and being able to access food that they could eat, that they enjoyed, and big mm. portions, mm. and made a lot. Of, you know what it is? It made people feel like they were valued. Yes. And 
you you wouldn't necessarily associate that with food but it is you know it's, it's a big deal so that's what we sort of learned very quickly is you know we were able to provide food that our people can actually eat and that made them feel part of the community valued worth something mm. yeah well it's part of the it's part of the uh, the triune of food shelter and clothing yeah if we don't yeah. have those three staples i mean this it it shows the indictment on mankind and society that we've got you know uh, all of these quote unquote multi-millionaires and you know the richest person in the world is now was B Bezos but now it's Elon Musk but yet we've got people who don't have access to clean water we have people who don't have shelter um, clothing or shelter we have people who are working but yet still have to go and rely on food banks this yes. is a, an upside down sort of reality that we're living in yes yeah and you can I think that's what we've seen actually um it's been sort of highlighted since the pandemic is is that great great disparity in um in wealth and a recognition that um if people are, are furloughed that a lot of people are living literally month to month mm -hmm. um and that all that really does is sustain a capitalist system it it doesn't sustain life and what i mean by life is being able to actually live um so yeah I, I feel like that's been highlighted more and more and obviously you know where money's gone <laughs> when it's come to things like uh track and trace and uh, all these things you know huge 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 amounts of money and um yeah yeah there was a the vote for providing um free school meals for children in poverty yeah. was denied it, you know explain that to me make make that make sense other but than yeah. pure greed pure yeah. greed but yet it took someone who kicks a leather football around mm -hmm. a youngster to, to to raise awareness and cause so much outroar in social media um sort of presence and and sort of knowing like what what's going on oh this this young footballer rashford he's he's gonna be doing this and then we get the u-turn and then we look at the scandal then after of imagery of unsanitary unsanitary um sanitary ways of of distributing food i'm seeing coin bags marcia with yes with with food in there with like rice or so i'm seeing apples that have been cut in half and it's the it, disgusting and it's supposed to be 15 pounds worth of food which is supposed to feed a child for a week it was appalling this, it was do you know what when i saw that image of what was provided i i couldn't believe it because we work at, we're working all of our food bank is covered by um funding applications that we get from different funders and we have to try and provide dry food parcels and cooked food for 100 people per week and we have to work that out roughly at about five pound a head mm -hmm. um so that the money can go and and this is the thing when you the area that i live in is high deprivation so there's high levels of poverty yes and i, I didn't um i personally haven't grown up with money we at one time our family was very affluent um, fairly affluent and then um divorce happened and that changed you know significantly so when you grow up like that you learn how to make your money last and you <laughs> learn where you buy your stuff from you learn where you buy your food from so you can get the most for your money mm -hmm. and, and that my staff team have also had similar experiences so when it came to doing this, we knew where we were going to be buying our, our stuff from. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it wasn't your big brand supermarkets, no. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was understanding um, poverty and it was understanding where you go to get the best value for money. Now, that doesn't mean that quality has to go down at all, but you just are, are, are cost conscious and you know where you're going to go to get the most for money. So what they provided the, the government provided to me just showed that they don't understand um where to they don't understand poverty and they don't understand where you go to get the best value for money for food because they throw money out the window 
you know <laughs> totally and then also the some of the mps friends um or they have shares in the said company who's delivering these parcels for 15 pounds and stuff it's like it's it becomes very murky when you when all of this becomes a little bit more transparent in regards to who's involved in what and what ties um and the contracts are given i mean tenders for this type of opportunity to to do this why is there why is there a direct link to, to politicians who have put forth a bill to say that yeah we're gonna we're gonna do this it, it, yeah, it's um exactly maniacal. i think um nepotism has always been a feature of power um but this government really has taken that to a next level mm -hmm. i mean you know, I so I sometimes do wonder when I'm I'm reading things on Twitter or social media about contracts and and who knows who and who's got an investment with who and who donates to Tory party and and I'm I'm reading this now and, and I'm just thinking, what? How can we have so many tame people in, in the UK? What by, I mean by tame is that we really should be as a collective, you know, because there's more of us than there is of them. And what I mean by them is this, you know, elite group that has a great deal of money and power, mm -hmm. but there's more of us that don't have that. Why aren't we coming together as a collective and saying, we, you know, we're, we are the people who have elected you in and not accepting this. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's blown my mind, but yeah, nepotism, this government's taking it to a next level. They, they really have. What it is is because we've been, um, as a, as a uh, society, as a as a culture, um, as the quote unquote underbelly and undercass, um, and in my opinion, there's no such thing as 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 upper, middle, and lower class. There's upper class and there's lower class. That's it. People who, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe in the eighties there was an illusion of a middle class of of sorts, maybe even up into the nineties, but today, as it stands, it's rich and poor, and that's what it is. Most people are living check to check. Exactly. And I, I think as well that the um, the creation of extra um, divisions in the class stratification is all about divide and and uh, divide and rule. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been um, a feature of, uh, of, of, you know, this country, but also other ones um, which, you know, propose a dem democracy um doesn't actually put that into practice and you know if we go back sort of what 100 years you it was that straight split you know it was the the, the rich or the landowners and the peasants you, do you see oh, you know 200 years but th you had that straight split and then when class comes in you have certain people getting a little bit more and then now think well i don't want to lose this so i'm going to vote for the people that will ensure that i keep my little bit more Yes. Um, rather than actually looking at trying to dismantle the, the power structures that keep the haves having. <laughs> it's it's a, a, a web of lies, trickery, and, and in some cases, sorcery that these people are, the powers that shouldn't be and should have never have been. They've created a very false sense of, um, as I say, of, of, of reality, of society. They've limited the, the potential of, of everybody. It's, mm -hmm. it's at the point now where you don't question anything. You, you get along, you go along to get along and, 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 and vice versa. And it's, it's a very, it's like you bend, you bend as, a, as a leaf a blade of grass does in the wind in any mm -hmm. direction. So whatever someone, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, let, let's kill everybody who's on the age of 20. If that's the consensus, yeah, then yeah, that, that, seems, that seems feasible because somebody with letters at the end of their name and maybe with a white coat have suggested such a thing. So it has to be true. And it's on the television. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. Who is it that says that? Um, it's a car or somebody else has, has said it as well, but the tell lie, lie mm -hmm. vision. <laughs> And that 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 goes that goes hand in hand with with words. How powerful mm -hmm. are words? Letters, yes. a collection of letters coming together to form words, spells. And then we when we when we use the word spell, we think of witches and wizards and warlocks, and we think of fantasy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, words, an, illusion. an illusion exactly. The English lang language, one of the newest languages that we have modern english mm -hmm. is one of the most deceptive and confusing languages 
that are around. Every mm -hmm. other language has a definite article. There's not a maybe. There's not a could of. There's not a might. It's either yes or no. Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. not there's, there's not three different meanings and spellings to the same word. There's just that one word. So mm -hmm. good morning, or we're mourning the death of somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. We 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 speak things into into existence, and we also destroy things by the way we speak to each other and greet each other by the verbiage. I totally agree. Totally agree. I was talking to a guest um, yesterday, um, American guest, and he, obviously, us in England have taken on this Americanism. They refer to their children as kids. And a mm -hmm. kid is a baby goat, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I always I always play this scenario out. So we call our children baby goats. And some of us who were actually raising our children correctly turn out to be, you know, adjusted, well, good serving members of society, quote unquote. And then we have mm -hmm. a, a minority who are literally baby goats running the streets wild, terrorizing everybody. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's this animalistic phraseology that we, we tend to throw on each other, chick, babe, dog, kid. You know what I, you know what I particularly don't like, and this might be like an unpopular <laughs> opinion, but I don't like it when I think about it, is um, in particular when Black people, when we call ourselves, like compare ourselves to food, so, you know, like chocolate and caramel and and things like that because when I think about it um I'm like what do you do with food you eat it you consume yes, it yes. and then you discard it and should we really be should we really be doing that is is that something that's productive for how we see ourselves individually and as a collective so yeah I mean that's my view P people may will disagree because I see a lot of things about you know chocolate and combat and, and meaning in a positive way yeah um, you know I, what Marsha I'm glad you have brought that up because you raise an excellent point and and and, and viewpoint to to what I've just highlighted because it is it you're exactly correct um and it is for us as original people, for us to refer to each other as that, it's not in a in a derogatory sense. It's a classification in regards to your tonage. Like we'd be mm -hmm. classed as yellow or red skin, as the old school term would be, you know, mm -hmm. um, brownings and all this kind of stuff. But the the, 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 the verbiage has, has has progressed. So as you say, you've got your, your caramel, you know, your chocolate cistrins and bread rinths and but yeah, you're right. When, when we peel back those layers, it, 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 it's the same thing. It, I, I still I, I see it as, I still see it as, you know, a, a, a thought, like a, a way of, of grouping us as something to be consumed and used. That's, that's just, it, it's, it's grown on me more and more. I think it's because I've seen quite a lot of rhetoric around, yes, the use of, you know, uh, chocolate and on social media you know it's increased I see it more and more and I just sort of think I don't know whether I feel comfortable with that and I definitely don't like being described as I'm sure someone described me before as a as a, as a caramel uh, caramel something and I just was oh. like what you know I'm <laughs> uh, you know and that's in reference to my uh, skin tone as well and I just thought no I'm not appreciating the foolish comparison yeah. um it's not something I do and that that's yeah it's, I mean, what happened to the old school days where you just light or dark? <laughs> With the light or dark skin? Oh, that dark skin, brother. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not liking the whole team team thing with that as well you know do your team light skin your team dark skin and even like the versus, it, it, it makes it a versus thing and I think we need to be really, really conscious that we are just working for the white supremacist system when we do that. We, we, we it, that's not taking away from the reality of colorism, mm -hmm. but colorism is a product of white supremacy. Oh, so yes. when we reinforce it with our actions and we have these daft challenges that I see on social media, team light skin versus oh. team 
that thing. We, we are doing the right supremacist work for it. We really are because we are dividing ourselves and um, um, putting each other down uh, based on our proximity to to whiteness, and uh, you know this 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 is part of the way that racism evolves. Objectification and it's reinforcing mm -hmm. whether, and I'm pretty sure you've had lengthy conversations about this, whether the the William Lynch letter is um, factual or not. The doctrine mm -hmm. within it is a hundred percent. And we can see that being played out to this day. Um, so I call it fiction. We can call it reality because we can see it played out. We can see it physically manifested today. We can see the division between old and young. We see the division between light and dark, male and female. Mm -hmm. It's played out. Yeah. For a purpose, always for a purpose. Always for a purpose, because uh, there's nothing wrong with celebrating the differences, but ultimately we're a one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, like I said, it's it's not about, you know, if, if somebody um, described me as light skinned, it wouldn't be that I would feel a need to correct them. Um, mm -hmm. If they're actually talking about my skin tone, it's when it's this versus thing in teams, because if you're in a team, yeah, you, you do it for your team, don't you? You know, you're not an individual, but you, you're, you're there as a collective part of that team. So when we it into teams and use that kind of language it creates a very different um i suppose feeling around around it it, it, it creates a very different response it it, it creates a, a them and us and and we really should be doing that totally and going um deeper into the, the the psyche of this whole this whole sort of colorism light team light skin versus team dark skin um within the male genre um, I find it more with darker skinned males, their idea of, of, of their feminine partner would be someone who's light skinned for them. That's, that's, that's their main sort of like view of beauty. Like, yeah, you know, People, you know, my skin color are cool, but I prefer and my preference is a light skinned women. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've seen that. I've, I think there's something great about social media and the way that there's been a pushback against that kind of narrative, you know, that mm -hmm. this is, but it, there is, there is, that is a, an absolute reality. And I've definitely experienced it, you know, particularly uh, when I've been in Jamaica I, the very first time I went I was actually shocked by it because I, I hadn't prepared myself for how blatant the colorism was you know and how a dark skin male would easily say well I, I don't like dark skinned women and that's, that's that's happened for me though um because of my self-education I instantly see it as you've internalized um white supremacy in this the, the, you internalize the concept of race yes. um, which white is based on and the concept of race at the root of that is a false um ideology that white is naturally superior so for a, a dark-skinned male to say that about a light-skinned female it's because you're wanting something that's closer to the to whiteness yes. because you believe that whiteness is, is superior and the, and there's for me you can you can say things about what well, it's just a look or no it's just my preference i'm sorry that is what it is you know, that is really what's at the root, is it? We've been taught it in so many different ways. So it's not a case of you've just done this, you know, you've, you have been taught it, but you must recognize that you have been taught that and then take steps to, to, to move away from that thinking. Mm. That, the, as you say, the key is to recognize it and growing up as, as, as young, as from a baby to a, t to a toddler infant, to a young, young, boy or young well especially on the male side a young boy to a you know get it going through puberty etc you are bombarded especially say if you were growing up in the 80s mm -hmm. you were bombarded with nothing but if it wasn't white women on television as the ideal of beauty it would be a light-skinned woman yes yeah so 100%. As, as a young black male that's what you thought was the, you know, that's what you thought you'd need, you know, your, your, your partner should look like some, you know, a white woman or a, a light skinned woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it took for myself, it wasn't until I was in my, I guess, very early teens 
did that preference of light skinned women kind of was was shattered because I was seeing all these beautiful women of various shades of of brown darker than the the light that I I preferred Mm -hmm. and I'd be like well why why would I well what's what's the issue kind of thing (laughs) you know why am Mm -hmm. I limiting myself just to saying I will only you know date someone who's my complexion or lighter kind of thing that that, Mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't make any sense yeah yeah and I think what you've just done there is is similar to I think what so many uh black people regardless of, of skin tone but people who who identify as black of African Caribbean heritage um is you go on a journey really when it comes to um race and racism and yourself it's yes. a journey through I I internalized aspects of um what I've been taught regarding the concept of race um because I, I couldn't stand my natural hair. When I was growing up, I absolutely hated my natural hair. And that is, again, similar because I'd been taught that what mm. I was seeing on uh, television, the only time I ever saw um, black women on television with their natural hair is if they were playing enslaved people. Yes. Um, or, or in some kind of derogatory, um, some t- kind of derogatory role. So it was never associated with uh, power or beauty or, and, and you know, we weren't seeing, um, you know, in my household, we weren't seeing, um, you know, Black Panther, women in the Black Panthers, you know, using their, their pros, throws with pride. Yes. I wasn't seeing that because they were, they were not given that kind of level of television exposure. No. Um, and that these are the things that are changing now. On one hand, these are the things that are changing with social media. But then on the other hand, social media is actually reinforcing the opposite. So, yeah, I went through a stage of wanting my hair always in um, extensions. Mm-hmm. Then it moved to, to weave and relaxing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I felt, I thought I felt better with that. And it was only after I had my, my first child, um, that I, I, and who, was, uh, who was a girl. And I just was, I was in the hair shop getting my hair done. And I just looked at her and I, I'm, there, I'm going to be there for at least, what, three or four hours, you know, getting the weave in and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, what am I teaching her? Yes. I'm sat here in the chair, altering my head. What am I teaching her? And I'm, I'm conscious. So now I've, I've been natural for, uh, I don't know, like 17 years, something like that. But Give thanks, Isla. <laughs> but I am really, really conscious that when I talk on these things, I'm not doing it to shame or to make any woman who, who wears weave or, um, you know, make them feel less than. That's not what, I, what I'm doing. It was a realization within myself that I didn't like my, my natural, my, my hair is very Afro textured. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't like my natural hair um, because I'd been taught to look down on it. And so if you're wearing a weave or, or, or you know, you're wanting to wear a wig because you want pink or blue hair, it, it, it is healthier to do that because than dyeing your own hair, you know? It's, so there is things around protective styles and I'm not denying that. And I don't see braids in the same way that I see weave. Weave where it's, it's, it's made to look like what we would class as European hair. Mm-hmm. It totally did. Braids for me is African. Yes. So it, it's got a totally different vibe to it. Um, but when it comes to weave, I think it's just about honesty. I did not like looking at myself in the mirror without a weave in. And I think there's a lot of women who, who could resonate with that. And so the moment you get your weave taken out, you know, you might have one day of, you know, wash and leave it out. And then you get your appointment, you know, I don't take my weave out. I wouldn't take my weave out until I had my next appointment booked. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, it was that deep within me, um, such a deep dislike of my, of my natural hair. So I went on, this is like my journey that I'm explaining, but I think um, it's, it's, it really calls on you to be very honest with yourself, very honest when it comes to this journey with race, what you've internalized and what you need to get rid of. And the most important thing which you, for yourself <laughs> and for, for, your, for your daughter's sake is that realization there is that mm-hmm. if you, you do it, continuing to doing that to do that is to perpetuate it because that young sponge of a young young girl who is watching you know the mother of the universe in essence Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what I want to do I want to do everything that my mom's doing so if my mom was wearing high heels I want to wear high heels if my mom's putting that wee stuff in her hair I'm doing that she's got them big long cat like fingernails mom like you know as, as, as soon as I'm able to talk and walk I want that stuff Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it's this This is something that's not, you know, specific. It's, it's something that that happens for all parents, you know, is is 
um, that hopefully that the, the idea would be that you would be healed as much as possible before you have children. So you yes. don't sort of pack your baggage on. Now that doesn't happen. That, that doesn't always happen. I was 21 when I had my first child. So rah, I was only just beginning to figure out who I was. Who I was. So um, it's, you know, we, we don't all have that ideal, but then when those, when those moments come, like me just looking at her in the, in the salon and she was playing with her toys, you see, cause you know, she was just kind of oblivious cause she yeah. was little. And just thinking to myself, I am, I am teaching her to do this. And, you know, going through that process of stopping, relaxing and weave it, uh, weave mm -hmm. was very difficult. And there were times when I wanted to give in, it was almost like giving up a, a, an addiction. Yes. Um, uh, like something that you could be physically addicted to, like, you know, alcohol or, or, or um, drugs, but it, it was like that. And because my hair, my natural hair was so badly damaged from the relaxer, mm -hmm. you know, I still hated it because now it's, it's, it's breaking, it's weak. Yeah. Um, so, but I had to really push through and keep the, the, the focus. Um, well, and another I, thing, Marsha, is that as, as I would imagine your mother and your mother's mother and people even today, they're not taught what products to put in their hair they don't know that they can just open up their cupboard and get the the hazelnut oil out the avocado oil the olive oil out and use that rather than getting dax and all kind of stray crazy stuff with parabens in it and 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 this this that and i can't even remember half of the damn somethings that are in there that are actually dish alcohol which is destroying your woolly nine ether curly hair ribboned mm -hmm. hair there is a difference between products which are made for tubular fur and ribbon curled hair. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in, in, my, in my situation, which a lot of people will be able to resonate with this, is I'm black mixed. Um, so my biological mother um, was a white woman um, and so the, the knowledge really wasn't there, but it also wasn't there in the mainstream mm -hmm. because the advertising, if you like, for products that would be suitable for my hair, not there. It's not there because this hair is, is, is not even worthy of having products advertised for. And you know what's so funny is that actually Afro hair is, is, is so common because of the number of, of people of African origin. Yes. Um, so it's, it's actually incredibly common. And it's only when, um, again, when you're talking about your capitalism, when businesses realize that that, that money can be made, mm -hmm. then you start to see these products trickle through into the, into the um, mainstream. I mean, I don't know whether you've seen on Twitter, it's been going wild, isn't it? The lady that sprayed her head with Gorilla Glue. Oh. <laughs> um, my, was that is do you think that's real do you think some people are that stupid to, to think that they could do that and their hairs and it's going to be fine do you uh... I don't know I I was I watched it and I just thought no it's like sister and just and no it... <laughs> what what like gorilla blue uh all right you know <laughs> all right I, I mean, I'm, I'm laughing it, it's not i mean it's funny in a way but it, it, it it's not but um because she'd run out of the the other the other product but um even things you know to do with like edges you know that this is obsession with ed edges you can't have any kind of like um pieces of hair standing up you know but you have to do your edges and this that and the other i sort of think how old school that is remember we were doing that in like the the, the the late 80s well yeah late 80s early 90s that was like the big thing no i mean well i i wasn't doing that because i just had extensions in extensions 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 so i wasn't i wasn't doing the you um, didn't even do your little edges man i'm just you must have been the only one sis because I, I you know I, i'm i remember all the girls were doing that with the little curls and little shapes that were used to use be hella creative Oh yeah, I mean, people are still doing that now, but I think it's about environment where I grew up. Um, mm -hmm. To give some context, um, is still a majority white area. It's it's changing quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. But when I was growing up, it was a real, real majority white area. Wow. And to, to add to that, I'm adopted as well. So um, my adoptive parents both were white. So yeah, we're talking about quite a specific um experience yes, most... that, yeah. yeah and sometimes people say to me how come you've you've ended up like you are <laughs> and what what they mean is that the work that i do yeah. um consciously very pro-black 
um, and really aware and wanting to dismantle the white supremacy. They're like, how did you get to that? And I'm like, because my, my siblings, my brother and my sister, both black mixed as well, adopted, um, but they just don't have, they didn't have the same drive. It was just something that was in me. And I've always seen, I've always seen the racism and mm. just trying to make sense of it, you know, and I'm not talking just about the blatant stuff. I mean, yeah, like I said, never seeing a, a woman, a, a black woman with Afro textured hair represented as beautiful. These things I noticed, I noticed these things for whatever, you know, it's whatever the divine has decided for mm. me, that was to be my purpose. Um, same way I remember asking my dad, I was like, dad, why is it whenever I see another black person on television, they're either starving, mm. diseased, yeah. or going to prison. Mm. And, you know, blessings for my dad, um, because it's very easy for whiteness to respond with a, you know, well, because there is a lot of poverty in Africa, because Africa is just a poor country, they actually call Africa a country, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and, yeah, you know, a lot of black men do commit crime, you know, to repeat the same old stereotype, it would be very easy for him to do that. And that might have influenced me in a certain way, but he just looked at me and said, you know, I don't have the answer for you. Wow. Um, and so he then went and got me books by black authors and that began my journey. Excellent. Yeah. Yes, I've been very blessed um, in, in that respect. And then I've always been a reader, you know, ever since and then you learn more and more and more. Um, and now he and I, we have very honest conversations about mm. um, uh, race and racism, the reality and the difference in our experience for, for him as a white man. Mm -hmm. um, for, for me, um, you know, my my brother as um as 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 black children, you know. Well, talk talk a little bit more about your siblings. I mean, now obviously times have have moved on. Are, are they sort of um moving more over to the 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 realization of like what what the the system is kind of thing, or are they still walking around in in sort of a blissful ignorance? Um, I say politely. Yeah, and um. And I totally appreciate it. You know what it is? Um, I've, you know, I sometimes feel that when I go on, on to, to shows like this and uh, people ask me questions and I think, oh, I hope I'm not killing the vibe. But um, my brother passed in 2014. Rising um, paradise. Thank you. Um, I'm in a place now where I can, I can definitely speak on his very racialized experience as a young black man. My mm -hmm. goodness the racial profiling, mm. the treatment in school, all of these things, his, his story has been a big teacher to me. Um, uh, but my sister, she's my, my older sister. Um, she, I think sometimes we make choices that we think will make our lives easier. Okay. Um, so for me doing this work, you know, you get a lot of backlash to it. And mm. um, I'm I'm fine with that because this is what I'm meant to do. It feels like this is my calling. It's in my it's in my soul. It's for me. It feels like my purpose. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, if if you're not feeling that same drive to put yourself out there, it might not be appealing. You know, so so yes, uh, there is a great awareness around you know the, the reality of racism that it's not just blatant that the totality of it is not just blatant name calling that there's other subtle systems constantly working for the white supremacist system. Mm -hmm. That acknowledgement's there, but I suppose the same desire to want to change that is not is not is not there. Definitely. Well, as you've highlighted, it comes along with a lot of responsibility and a lot of challenges. You know, it's mm -hmm. easy just to keep your head down, don't ask any questions, and just keep you know just keep on working. You'll get paid, and there's not going to be any problems. It's easy mm -hmm. to do that because most people, most individuals, regardless of ethnicity, race, whatever, however you want to designate these labels that we're given. Um, everyone wants a peaceful life. Everybody wants to live. At yeah. the moment, so many of us are just existing. Yes, yes. That's my strap line. That's my pinned tweet on Twitter is don't just accept and exist, challenge and live. That's how I feel. I don't expect everyone to feel like that, but it, it's something that's very, very, very deep in me that cannot be ignored. Um, so yeah, we, we, we take different approaches, but don't get me wrong. I have worked in environments where there's been times when I haven't said what I felt to say. And there's definitely been experiences with my, my brother in the police where I've tried to keep the, you know, where I wanted to say mm -hmm. something about the racism, but for fear of what might happen to my brother, yeah, I haven't said it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I've always, you know, I've always been like a Malcolm X, you know, always calling well, it out. And, Marsha, look, we can't be, it, 
we, it's not a hundred percent 24 hours of the day is it we no we, we burn ourselves out we, we we can't there's not every battle cannot be fought by the same person so mm. you've got to be strategic um mm -hmm. especially as you say if you're dealing with loved ones which and which your actions could then affect it's it's mm -hmm. a it's a balancing act it's a really a fine line between trying to uplift fallen humanity and change the circle and the situation of people around you and and, and the greater um populi and keeping yourself safe keeping yourself happy um mm -hmm. paying bills this is a it's it's not an easy easy road by mm -hmm. far so people can be sitting in the comfort of their home and type horrible comments about people and all of that kind of stuff and live such a boring, average, non-existent life, have a terrible relationship with their friends and their family, may not even have any friends. And their only way that they can feel alive is to be horrible to people on social media or on uh, yeah. YouTube and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 You're completely right. Yeah. This is part of the control plan and the plan for society to you know i mean look <laughs> when i was growing up there was one television in the house which was in the living room yes and we had four stations <laughs> yes, Sam, 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 <laughs> you, you know the ones and at a certain time the tv would done I think it was like at one o'clock or 12 o'clock or something. All you'd see was just fuzz, just the white snow. And on BBC, that that little crazy girl with the chalkboard or whatever, yeah? Yes, yeah, yeah, I remember it. So outside of that television, which has a flicker rate, which puts you into a hypnotic state, mm -hmm. outside of that, we went out and we played tracking, you know, we built tree houses, we were riding bikes and stuff, we were building go-karts and stuff, you know, we were out there, man, living life, experiencing, falling down, cutting our knees and stuff, um, mm -hmm. you know, being children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and then the computer age came, we had the, the, the 64, the Sinclair, which was very expensive, so maybe one of your richer friends you could go to their house and put the tape cartridge in and make it load up for 45 minutes to play <laughs> oh yeah i do i remember well we had like um my we didn't have we had a games console we did get um nintendo um and then my dad had an atari computer and there was some cute computer games on that in black and white yes and they were really <laughs> <laughs> yeah but um those when you think when I think back to those things, it's like great nostalgia because um, my my brother and I that there's a year gap between us, mm -hmm. so um, we were very 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 close, like best best friends, you know, even as brother and sister, best friends. So all of these memories have him in. He's in every single one of them. Like our computer, our Nintendo was shared. It was between me and me, he and I, mm. um, and it's just it's. I absolutely loved our childhood. We were proper outdoor kids um, and just climbing, falling. <laughs> this is it, mixing it up. Yeah, all of that, all of that like uh, good stuff. So um, yeah, that's the, that, I think that's the beauty of healing, you know, because for a year after he passed and it was a solid year, I was in such a deep state of depression and I had, I, would, I kept thinking to myself, I wish I hadn't known him. Now that might sound really strange, but grief can be a strange thing. And what I meant by that is that I wish I didn't feel this pain because yes. I don't think I'm ever going to be okay again. Mm -hmm. um, and the pain was was substantial. You know, it it it, it if every morning I'd wake up and I just think, what's the point? He's not here now. Yeah. And then every breath of that day hurt. You know, I felt every breath it hurt. Everything hurt. Um, so, it, and but now. And that the amount of healing that's happened um, and the connection that I feel to him still and allowing myself to still feel that connection, even though he's not here in the physical and the spiritual, my man is my greatest, <laughs> like, like my greatest supporter, source of comfort, you know. Um, mm. So now I, have to go, I love those memories. I love remembering playing and all that stuff we did as kids. It was great stuff, yeah. That's what creates and builds people um human beings mankind to be in a position where they can 
challenge potentially authority or, or critically think when they when they've created this technological society where I mean look at the games consoles were like 16 bit then it went mm -hmm. to 32 bit then it went to 64 mm -hmm. 32 and after that point Marsha I was done because mm -hmm. the games started getting real realistic in regards to yeah. You know, before it would be cartoon characters and you know, you had your Street Fighter, your Mortal Kombat, which was pretty yeah. realistic as well. That was of course a lot of um sensation when it first came out. But now it's it first did. person shooter, killer, going growing weed and raping and beating up women and driving cars and running people over. And this is yeah. legal. Yeah, 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 yeah. And even though the net the, the age is put on it it's it's still like it's just that's really just a sort of legality for the company so they can keep yes. on making it when it's it's totally recognized that um your children under the that age specified age are, are playing on it and being yeah being all like all consumed um by it so yeah it is um and the more that we I mean, I, I don't watch television. I stopped watching television years ago. Mm -hmm. If I do watch something, it's something that I've chosen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's probably more on your Netflix. Um, yes. But I don't just watch any old thing that just pops up on Netflix. I actually consider to myself, how is this going to affect my energy? Mm -hmm. And I tell you now, um, I stopped watching films um, on, on uh, racialized slavery Okay. years ago. And when anyone says to me, well, haven't you seen that? I thought you'd have seen that. I'm like, why, why do I want to see that oh, trauma? No. Mm -hmm. Why do I want to put myself through that pain yeah. of watching that mm -hmm. when I, I read the book of the people that were enslaved? I don't yeah. need to see the films, you know, made by a, a white director who's, who's getting paid enough money. You know, I don't, I'm not putting myself through that trauma. <laughs> Um, so I, I make the choice and I'm conscious as well with um, and I think it's a good thing because my children don't see me constantly watching programs where when I was growing up, my mum always had TV on. It was like <laughs> the thing. You always had TV on. You couldn't EastEnders. Not have oh, EastEnders. Coronation Street, EastEnders, <laughs> Neighbours, Home Brookie. and Away. <laughs> well, you know, there was a set pattern. And my mum used to buy TV Guide and she'd oh, circle the thing. You know it. You know it, Marsha. <laughs> TV Guide. Remember the Christmas TV Guide? a big, massive one that used to come out. <laughs> yeah, and then, then what you get you all excited. And she'd circle. She'd put a circle around the things that she was going to videotape. <laughs> mm. This is a videotape, not 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 instant, re not the recording. You can program what, I mean, which is, you know what? There's some elements of technology which is excellent like um, TiVo or whatever the hell the Sky version is where you can pre-plan like what you want to watch and if you're obviously working, et cetera, you can have it record and then watch it later and all that. Excellent. That yeah. is absolutely excellent. That, that helps people who have, because, you know, we're working a lot more these days. It's not as simplistic as it was, you know, 10, 15, 30 years ago. People are working a lot more hours of the day. Um, mm -hmm. So that element of technology I embrace it and I think that's cool. But as mm -hmm. I say, we've become so technologically advanced that um, I'll say we loosely, but we have become, yeah. we're, we're devoluting into homonyms, into troglodytes, into mm -hmm. pre, pre homo sapien sapien. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, you've got people literally walking around with crack phones like just glued, walking around, bumping into lampposts, he's tripping over things, bumping into people and stuff. And they think this is all, this is cool. This is the thing. Yeah. Everywhere you look, mm -hmm. people have got these little headphones in and they're typing away furiously. Oh, I've got to text. I've got to, I've got to go into Twitter. <laughs> it's just like, live life, why don't you? Yeah, take your head out the screen, basically. Yeah, look up and see. And um, that's what I, I um. I, I really had a proper blessed childhood and I've, I've been raised, um, my dad is like a, a fell runner. So he, when we were children, we'd be traveling all over the country, Lake District, Scotland, beautiful, beautiful nature areas, mm. natural areas and running, um, running up hills, running down the hills, swimming in lakes, swimming in rivers. I've had that kind of childhood. So I feel very connected to nature. I think nature is such an important aspect of keeping you grounded, mm -hmm. but also that separation from the, from the technological, if you will. Um, so it's, it, you know, it's something that I want to try and repeat as much as possible with my, with my children. 
bearing in mind that yeah time is a factor you know being able to go and travel to these type of places but yeah nature is really important connection to nature and yet there's this I know when I go to London sometimes I go to London to do pieces of work after two days you know I'm like I need to I need to get out of here <laughs> the, the amount of people building yeah. mm -hmm. um like sort of human constructs um the vibe and... there's a vibe if you're walking around london there is just a vibe down there man yeah yeah and the speed you know run 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 yeah. run don't stop don't look don't get there do, you know and um it's it's cool you know when i was younger i really appreciated it you know i saw london as the city mm -hmm. but then you know, as i've got older i'm like I, I appreciate it for a visit but i am glad to leave and come back to sort of the big wide open spaces of the north if i'm honest most definitely i mean i'm, I'm glad um sunny brom is not it is it's kind of getting a little bit like london of sorts i mean i with all of the um Agenda 21 and all that kind of stuff that's going on, or Agenda 2020, I should say. Um, the, the city centres are just, they're mirror images of each other. You can go to any town city centre and they're exactly the same as Manchester, Liverpool, Bradford, Leeds, London. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same, one-way road systems. You can't even get in there. Everything's all changed up. They're just building, digging up every damn where. They're putting up damn um, residential apartments like you wouldn't even believe. And you're thinking, well, who the hell in Birmingham is going to be buying houses, well, apartments even, for like a million pounds and stuff in the centre of town? Who 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 does this? Yeah, well, why would you, why would you want to? It's like kind of my my thought. Why would you want to 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 live in such a I also think as well, you know, when you have multiple people in a place, you have multiple energies mm -hmm. and in, in London and, and it's important to be able to pull back and, and have, you know, time with your own energy. And I find in London that it's just not possible because if you, if I go down and I stay in an apartment, for example, um, there's people below me, yeah. there's people above me, there's people to the side of me. I just feel like there's all these constant energies that I find kind of exhausting. It's, you know, it's, yeah, it's, um, that's the plan. And, and, and uh, as you mentioned, energy, that, that is the whole, I'm sure, I need to get the name of this. Every time I refer to this, I forget the name of the experiments, which was done in the 50s, I think it was, when they created that rat population and created basically a, a, a flat and watched how they, the, the rats socialize. Have you ever watched that experiment? I've heard of it. I don't know whether I've watched it. I don't think I have, no, but I have heard of it. And then from there, that's how they created the quote-unquote projects of America and urban housing. <laughs> so it's cramming people on top of each other rather than how most of the quote-unquote elites live and most of people who have access to the fiat currency, they live far apart from each other. They've yes. got a house and it's not attached to another house. <laughs> you know, there's, 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 there's some, some places there's expanse of grounds which separate each house and that is for mm -hmm. energy reasons and purposes as you say if you've mm -hmm. got a condensed people 500 people living on the on the square acreage which four or five people can live we've got a mixture of energy we've got tension we've got then physical boundaries and, and areas which we're, we're going over and stuff we've just got a recipe for disaster yeah, exactly exactly yeah totally agree all by design mademoiselle but it's it's for the people who can have the eyes to see and the ears to hear hear which are actually like mm, this this one on one equals two not 25 like what we're talking about here mm -hmm. and i think it's um about allowing yourself to feel i think um with us so much advancement in technology and with us being increasingly cramped into spaces around others we we don't actually give ourselves times to time to feel so you might not be able to feel um a, a, a disalignment in energy um because you, you, you're not feeling um and that's why nature is really good because in nature i i when i go out in nature i feel mm. i feel um so yeah i think it, it's 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 not just like you know the see and the hear but it's the feel what what are you feeling and i think so many people don't don't know they don't know what they're feeling because they're connected to the um the technology or they're connected to the all the numerous energies that are around them
that as well. And also, if we add on to that, we've got the ego, which is driving the, uh, the, 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 the personage rather than really having the experience. And then you've got the other half of that. So the true self is, is, is literally a prisoner within the shell. The ego is mm -hmm. driving the, 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 the vehicle that we're in. And then you've got the auto program character taking over 60% of the time to do the mundane mm -hmm. tasks to drive to yeah. and from work, to greet people, to have the conversation with, with your significant other who you don't really like. So the auto program character comes on and da 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 da. And it's just ego. So the self is just, it's a prisoner trapped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I let, completely agree. <laughs> let me out. <laughs> <laughs> you need to feel that the spirit, I think it's, but yeah, ego is um, an ego um is about individualism and individualism is ultimately tied to capitalism as well so capitalism encourages individualism um by by teaching us you know well um be jealous they teach us it teaches us comparison so you're supposed to look at the person next to you do they have a more expensive coat are they driving a better car than you or a more expensive car than you um and then what that leads to um and i speak about this particularly with young people in the work that i do i speak with a lot of young people um about recognizing that uh, capitalism doesn't ever really want you to like yourself because if you like yourself you won't keep buying products to alter yourself and then they're like whoa <laughs> this, yeah. This is like, yeah that and i'm like seriously so if if you're um driven by ego you're going to be affected by jealousy and you're going to look at the person next to you and think right they have this and now i want it so but i, I i'm not making enough money to get that so i'll get a loan or a credit you know <laughs> and then, then, well, then we're going into that spiral of you know that capitalism we're meeting the needs of, of, of capitalism it's the same with plastic surgery as well i feel for, for a lot of plastic surgery not all and, and some of it is you know about reconstruction stuff like that i'm not saying plastic surgery is profession overall is bad but where it's um you know about getting uh, a, a a bigger backside um or where you know um or this thing around europeanizing features you know making your eye shape different or making your nose different which is um, massive within the the, the the asian culture isn't it the eye it's, yeah, surgery it's huge it's huge the 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 um the eye surgery um it, it's all of this is is driven so that if you don't like yourself, you're just going to keep buying and buying. And I've I've seen some programs about people who are addicted to plastic surgery, and the results really bad. It's not good. It you know, isn't. That, it's isn't it? Isn't it? Wouldn't I would class those people as of of, of having um, if the term is even correct, body dysmorphia. Yeah, and I think that is the term. And um, and yet they're going to doctors. They're going to actually qualified medical people who are not saying to them, listen. You know, yeah. you need to stop this now. You know, I've I've seen a guy. He had these like uh, like a chest implant, but it oh. wasn't for, for breasts. It was you know to look like muscle. Yes, I've seen them. I've seen yes. Yeah, because he didn't he didn't want to exercise, but he wanted that that frame. And uh, you know, and and he'd had a lot of work done in his face. He looked plastic. You know, he, he looked like he was, yeah, he looked like he was wearing some kind of a mask. It was, mm. and and um. And yet I couldn't see him stopping anytime soon. It was just more and more and more. He had, uh, you know, biceps put in. Biceps. Uh, it, it, Didn't you have the abs as well? Didn't you have the ab things put in as well? He's the same yeah. person. Yeah. And, and then, and then he'd look in the mirror and it, you know, one of them was sliding or altering, you know, the, 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 the implant got, so then he has to go back and get more and more. Mm. And it, it, just think, goodness, where, you know, where's that going to end? It's yeah. So, but I always say that, you know, capitalism does not want you to like yourself because Otherwise, you're not going to spend money to alter yourself. Well, and it's, I, look at the plethora of brands that we have at. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that just goes to show you that they're giving you not one, not just one avenue of a designer brand. We've got a plethora. So you can, you can stand there and be a consumer still, but you can stand out buying uh, Givenchy, you can buy uh, Ralph Lauren, whatever the, well, these are all old brands, I guess. I guess there's all these new Fendi and whoever else that I can't even pronounce them names that they've got out these days, but it's giving you an illusion of choice, but leading you down the same road, thousand mm -hmm. plus pounds for footwear. Yes, exactly. And people don't even own their own house. Like, are we, are, are we serious? 
wearing little <laughs> man bags and stuff that are, again like hundreds of pounds and belts and these little hats and stuff like look i get it right if we're in successful if we're successful um there's nothing wrong with treating yourself i have no problem um, with that mm-hmm. I have none whatsoever if you want to be all designer logoed out <laughs> by all means do it if you got if you can put food in, in in the in the fridge um your bills are paid your mortgage is paid all them kind of things that's that's all gravy but when you're living on a council estate and, and you're living with your mom or your girlfriend herself these are things that are just this is fantasy this isn't a yeah. priority there's needs and wants and don't get it twisted mm-hmm. as, as youngsters, but, you know, you're full of your gumption and like, you know, the marketing's really out there and, you know, you ain't cool unless you've got the damn red bottom things and, you know, all right, then what I want to be cool then. <laughs> How about that? You know, mm-hmm. I'm no. going mm-hmm. to live life. I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy life. I'm going to do the things that I enjoy doing. I'm not looking to, to follow fashion like yo. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I agree. It just takes a, a certain type of personality to to not be sucked into um, into consumerism, um, because again, it comes down to this like that ego thing of I'm looking over there though, and I'm seeing that I don't have that, and they're getting um, props for that. If someone's getting props for their shoes that they they haven't made them, do you know what I mean? It's not like they like oh wow, that's a talent you've made. If someone's getting props for their shoes because they could afford them. Um, then really what is being complimented there? I don't, you know, but it's 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 difficult when we are, you know, we, we live in such a, a consumer material yeah. uh, capitalist kind of kind of world. And, you know, I'm older now, so it's, I, I've had my time of that for, for yes. certain. Um, so I'm definitely not sitting up here on a pedestal, but because I work with youth, it's important that I share my learning with them as much as possible. What they'll do with it is totally their choice. Totally. Everyone has their own journey and they will, they will go on that own, their own, that own journey. Um, I mean, as you say, keep taking it back to, to reality, I mean, there was a version of that of sorts. I mean, it, it's obviously dramatically increased in the, in the latter years, but the, the, uh, as a youngster going to school, the most important, not one of the most important thing, but as long as you had name brand trainers, yeah. that, that was it. So you could have yeah. Puma, you could have Nike, Adidas, Reebok, you know, as long high tech, you know, back in the day. Um, as long as the, they were a, a name brand and it wasn't like, mm, actually, you, you could even probably pass with Gola as well. You could probably even get away with Gola. Um, you couldn't with Dunlop. You couldn't with Dunlop. Donnie's, <laughs> no, you could not Donnie's. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, <laughs> you would that would be a, a, akin to buying do you, do you remember those indian man um trainers that you'd get and they were just plastic soles and they would just yeah. rip. <laughs> you might as well just buy them if you're gonna buy <laughs> the donnies <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, that was the case as well like yeah is if you had some kind of name on it but then now like I've seen some of the shoes produced by oh, Kanye, the Yeezy. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that is the ugliest. Mm. I, I mean, that is an ugly shoe. And 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 so crazy, crazy money. But because of the branding behind it, because of this exclusivity consumer, as well. Um, you know, people that people are pushing to to buy and spend a lot of money on an ugly shoe that doesn't look good. <laughs> yeah, and and also what he's done as a, as a, as a result of that, he's um, he's almost changed the language of the shoe game because everyone's doing this sucking stuck in inspired sh- trainer kind of thing, and mm-hmm. it, it looks mm-hmm. absolutely awful. And, and then them was it them Ben Ben Ten Siago things? They look absolutely awful, like moon boots. But again, as I say, look, I'm old to old school, like Shell to Adidas. So who am I? You know, I'm just I'm just a person with an opinion. Some people think they're all, they're cool and it's all gravy. Me, give me some one tens, <laughs> and, and, and I'm cool. Or give me some some Reeboks or something like that. I'm I'm cool with them. I, I'm not yeah. I'm not interested in all that 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 other stuff, man. It's 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 weird. It's new age, man. It's it's so so new age. And then as a male. If I wanted to go out 
and purchase jeans and stuff. Do you know how difficult it is? Everything is slim fits, um, legging style thing and <laughs> short and tight and like I, 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 I'm a man. Like, where's the men's clothes kind of thing? <laughs> I, I, I do like this style, but I think it is because, you know, our of our generation. But I did, all, I loved all the style of, um, you know, like the, the conscious um, hip hop rappers from the States. So your Tims, your Baggy. Tims, your Cross Baggy. Colors, your Carl Kanai. Mm. These are the things that I, 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 I really liked. And I saw that as, you know, that looks good. Um, but yeah, it's, it's gone. It's gone a completely, um, it's gone a completely different way. And, and also this like increasing um uh promoting um males wearing dresses oh. now when i when i say this it's it's not to say if you want to do something you can do it but what i've noticed is that a great deal of attention is given in particular from the media to a black man wearing a dress to um like a movie premiere or something and you're just thinking hmm, i find i find that quite interesting is the amount of uh, of attention that gets um when what what is what it when that gets a great deal of attention but then at the same time um another black man at the same premiere who's wearing a, a, a particular suit doesn't get that same level of exposure why is that why is there that kind of like disparity you know i don't know it's there's it, an agenda it falls in line with something which has been highlighted for some a number of years with the feminization of black males it's mm -hmm. it, it's it it's more than overt now, more than overt. Now look, mm -hmm. there is a, a big debate of sorts, you know, um, whether people choose a lifestyle or whether they're born that way. I'm not going to have that conversation now. That that's going to be a, a, a totally different build. But it, it it would seem that, and when we talk about the feminization of black males. There are clearly levels to this, so we can have men who are in touch with their their feminine side of sorts, if you could say that. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't suggest that is part of the feminization of males. What I'm talking about is the overt changing of males' masculine identity of what they think they should be in the world. So... Mm -hmm. I'm not seen as anything. I don't have any rights. The way I can make myself have some rights and be seen as somebody, if I can put, if I put a dress on, if I um, become gay, if I have surgery, or you know, all of these kind of things, I'm now accepted. I'm I'm part of a new class of the minority, which has rights and has and and has other things. Me as just a black male, I'm I'm nobody. I have no voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there is there, there definitely is an element to that. It's really who's given platform, um, and um, sometimes it's 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 similar to to um, a, a, you know lighter if lighter skinned people are getting platform, what's going to you know and, and access and exposure, which we are taught are good things, which I don't know necessarily whether they are. Um, then you're going to want to do take buy a product or something that can make you um, lighter. You know the the whole thing with um, I've seen progression of, of bleaching products, um, and what's what's so scary about it is that even in um, majority black countries, bleaching increasing um, because there's a definite economic connection there. The lighter that you are. Um, the more likely you are to have a higher paid job. So it's not even just about bleaching for the for the aesthetic of it. It it also has an economic um, incentive. It has an economic yeah, it has an economic incentive. And then the last thing that I've seen is these bleaching baths. Have you seen those? Baths? Oh I've my seen... goodness. It's you mean scary. the homemade? You mean the people who'd made do the homemade stuff and they fill up the water and put all the chemicals no. in? No, these are like salon baths in salons. Um, what? It, it was a video that went viral. I'm, I, I, I promise you, I, I couldn't believe this thing. And, and I, I'm desperately, I'm still trying to do research on who's created this product, this bath. But basically, the woman goes in and they just scrub her skin off. And, and she comes out practically white. 
Um, what? I'm sure the, video, the, the video that I saw that went viral, I'm sure that was... Is that, the, uh, is that the continent of Africa from, maybe? I feel like it was, um, I'm trying to think of which country and I don't want to get it wrong. So the, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain it wasn't in the Caribbean. I'm pretty certain it was on, in, on the African continent. And yeah, she literally came out, they just scrubbed off her skin. Uh, whatever's in that water, Ooh. I don't know what is in that water, but they just took off her skin and she was, she was white. And I, I just thought, Lord. Now this, uh, that treatment is not cheap. So it's not openly available for everyone to do. Mm -hmm. um, but those that, that can afford it, I'm, I'm sure will. And was it, she in pain, Marsha? No, no, she was. Well, she didn't appear. She definitely didn't make any noise about pain. So that she's in the bath, and then this woman, the, the the woman that works in the salon, came along with like a scrubbing brush, and just started to scrub um, mm -hmm. her legs, and that's what you saw. And it, it just all fell off. You know, all the top layers of skin that contained the uh, melanin. Melanin. Oh my God! The Most the High bless this woman with. Mm -hmm. Melanin, and she's doing everything within her power. I mean, look, look at the, look how she's going to be open to infection sores and all kinds of stuff now. Yes, yeah, taken off what, what maybe two or three layers of, of the epidermis. Easy, it's it, easy, and the water actually changed color. You know, as it was falling off the skin, as it was being scrubbed off, the water that you sat in changes to brown, and. Yeah. It, it really distressed me. It distressed me so much because I thought this is just going to grow. This is not something where there was outcry. I don't get me wrong. There was lots of people saying, what is this monstrosity? But um, we, we know that these products sell, even if people are going to do it, you know, undercover because they feel embarrassed about it or whatever. Um, but yeah, so it's, it was, it was really, <coughs> excuse me. It was really disturbing. Uh, Yes, that's the word. I was going to say I was distraught, disturbed, all of them things. All of the above. I, I, I'm shocked. I mean, I've, I've seen something. Maybe, maybe it's the same. No, it couldn't have been the same video. I saw a video and it was literally, and this was, I'm sure this was the Caribbean because she was giving like a tutorial kind of thing. And she went and she poured, filled the bath up, poured all kind of, all these different brands of, of skin bleach and ting. And she, no, she mixed it up in a tub first, uh, something up in the tub. She was pouring stuff into the bath and she poured it in there, lay in there and she was scrubbing and she, she was, it wasn't as dramatic as you were saying, as you've described, but she, it was a similar kind of thing they were trying to achieve clearly. It's, it's insanity. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I just keep always referring it back. It's the product to living in a, in a racialized world where the concept of race is built into everything. Um, and I've seen a few um, of videos in the, in the Caribbean of people sharing, you know, how they how they bleach their skin. Um, and there was a good documentary actually called Bleaching in Poverty. And, um, you know, that the, there was numerous different types of product put together, um, steroid cream, um, bleach that you use for bleaching your hair, um, other things. And then it's smeared all over the body and then the body's covered in cling film. Yes, and, I seen it. Um, yeah, and then when they cut it off, it's just like the skin's just falling off and you just pull it off. It's, yeah, and obviously the, the medical implications for that, for your actual um, health are, are definitely not good. Um, and yet, you know, we do these things, damage ourselves because of what we've been taught of how to see black skin mm. in, in, the, in this system. So it's, yeah. It's, it's very much, it's very much damaging. Um, I don't think people really understand, overstand, or even understand how deep it, it goes into the um, the conscious and the subconscious. Yeah, and I think that's one of the that's one of the complexities. It's one of the deliberate designed complexities when it comes to race, because on one hand we are told that race is just skin colour and that means nothing, it's just skin colour, but race is actually an idea. Um, it's, it's, it's an idea that's built on this, this false ideology of natural rights priority, but it's also who has the power to shape the construction of race, who has the power to shape the stereotypes that are attached to skin colour, and that's really what race is. Um, mm. And then we are taught that in, through it, I'm, I'm going to nick from Dr. Frances well Cress Wilson. I was I sent you that telepathically, sis. I was gonna mention her name. 
small areas of people activity. And it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Rising paradise to the great. Most definitely, yes. Well, yeah, one of my, my um, well, one of the role models that, you know, she's inspired me massively, massively. She should be celebrated a lot more than she's, um, she had yeah. ISIS papers. I mean, like, come on, man. Like, that's yeah, the- that, that, that should be up there with that. Like, you know, like people always refer to the, the autobiography of Malcolm X, mm. um, which, I, you know, I, I totally get that. But it, uh, that book, the ISIS papers should be up there with, with, with that book. It's, you know, for, for, for understanding. So, you know, some theory, you might read it and some theories not agree with, um, but under the, her understanding of, of race and how serious race and racism is, is undeniable. Um, and the way she breaks it down for me is, is undeniable. And also Carter G. Wilson, the miseducation of the Negro. Yes, yeah, it's um, Woodson, Carter G. Woodson. Woodson, sorry, Woodson, apologies. Yeah, yeah no, that, that, was, that was another, that was another. You know what's so mad about that book is it was written 1933. Everything this is the thing. Is the, is the same everything you're like rah that's why I think I spend so much time focused on education because I see education as one of the one of the really key institutions in reproducing and evolving um racism so uh, because every everything he said in that book applies today except mm. we wouldn't use the term negro I think that that's the only difference yes well you know if we every 10 years or so um afro caribbeans afro british afro americans the title or african if you want to change that title that first part the, our mm. title is just changed every 10 yeah. years yeah now, now um, we've got this stupid bammy thing bame, like, what, bame. What, what the hell's that no, most people don't know what BAME is. Um, Black, Asian, ethnic, um, no, minority ethnicity. Yeah, minority ethnic. And it just, it, I mean, oh. I always say it's a government created term um, to just group a load of people together and say you will all have the same experiences. But within that category, you have white Australians. Mm. You know, if they're living in this country, they're an ethnic minority. Exactly. But they have the same experiences as a black British person who was born here. I very much doubt it. Or an Asian person that was born here or migrated, whichever one, you know, I very much doubt. In fact, it's not I very much doubt it. I know that they don't. Yeah. So why are they put into, you know, it, it, make, it makes no sense. It's just a way to, to, to come forward with this whole like colorblind. Mm. What's, yeah. your, what's your um, idea on second, third, and even fourth generation um, original people being in England or Britain and having the identity of British? That's, you know what, I think that's an interesting one because um, when, when I was younger, I would identify as British. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as I got older, it was actually re- reactions and responses from other people that maybe then question, am I British? Mm. Because it would always be that, you know, but where are you really from? Yeah. And I think, you know, <laughs> that old chestnut. <laughs> that one, I, people, we, we still have that though, that hasn't gone away. So you're, you actually get taught to see yourself as not British anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, I mean, I have a British passport. Um, you know, I, I, I have British on my birth certificate. But do I actually feel it? Mm. That's that's a, that's a different question. So I, I, again, you know, it, I I couldn't sort of I couldn't sort of say how I would feel about other people who identify you know as, as British if they're black because it's it's totally it's dependent on their journey. Yeah. yeah. For me, that's been one of the the key factors in you know how British do I feel. Um, has been from other people telling me that I'm not because <laughs> you know, I'm not allowed to be despite yeah. accent, despite going through the school system here, despite being born here, mm. passport, all that, I'm still not allowed to be. You, you raise an ex- excellent point. People reminding you saying, well, so, but you, where are your parents from though? Like, where, where, where are you from? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> if we are talking about, I was born here. Like, what are we talking about? Mm-hmm. Like and, and the younger generation who were like the third and fourth generation, like what 
someone asking them that question, like, what you, how are you talking about? I was born here. My mum was born here. My grandmother was born here. I'm British. Yeah. My lineage is from Africa, potentially, or my lineage is from the Caribbean, potentially. But I am British. The same as, mm-hmm. how are you, Bridget? Can you trace your lineage back? Like, how far do your grandparents, etc., come come back to this 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 rock that we call Britain? Oh well, we came we came from we come from Ireland or we're um, we're from Denmark originally. My grand's from Denmark or like so. How, how are you, British? Exactly, exactly. It's this sort of reinforced um, lie that there is an indigenous. Uh, people to this country which is an absolute lie because you know we're going back so many thousands of years but Rome uh, Britain was a Roman colony Colony, and people migrated here from throughout the Roman Empire um, similar to how people migrated to America Mm -hmm. um, after it had been a colony um, you know where some of the, the states were British colony and so on they migrated there it's built America is built on migration as is is Britain Australia and people get really upset about that because they're like well what do do you mean and and that migration leave necessarily have to be people of color if we always have this idea that you know migrant means color it it doesn't in the in the Roman in the Roman it it could have been from anywhere absolutely anywhere including from the African continent Um, and we did that here so you know there is no indigenous peoples to the, the to this island and yet this is belief that there was and that's why you're you know, you're proper British and people do this thing of you know but you know you're proper British people you're like right okay <laughs> you you know but. and to add some more contextuality onto that the you know we had the the Normans come over we had the the Vikings come over the Picts were already here and if we do and I I, I encourage everybody to not just romanticize and look at brave hearts and you know, Mr. Gibson playing his little role and stuff and that blockbuster. Look into who those people were and why were they, what what was this blue? What did the blue represent? And what did blue represent in ancient times? Mm -hmm. Who who Mm -hmm. was described as the tall blue men (laughs) who came on the ships? Like, who were Mm -hmm. those people? Those are some, Mm -hmm. some, some interesting questions. And if you can get to the, if you can get the answers, a lot of things start to make sense. Yeah. And we can see that our presence in this little island <laughs> that we reside on has been a little, li- a little bit longer than was advertised. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then also looking at, you, as you mentioned, the, the colonies of America, um, the New World, as it was called. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the New World. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then you've got Australia. People went over there to, to seek fortune for a better life due to um, persecution from the king, um, religious freedoms, allegedly. And let's not forget that people sold themselves into servitude because there was nothing guanine over here, nothing for them. Yeah, yeah. For 13 to 15 years, they would be under servitude so they could have a chance to go over to to the new, quote-unquote, new world, work their debt off, and then be free. They also sent criminals convicts orphans and obviously bandits went over there to rape and pillage that place as much as they can it was a new source of opportunity Mm -hmm. australia was not was that a penal colony in essence yeah i I believe it was yeah it was a penal colony so mm -hmm. so you you know the actual indigenous people of australia you know there was you had same as what happens same as what happens with colonialism you know yeah um killed uh given restrictions you know this is the area that you occupy mm-hmm. uh controlled and that's and then you know now what we would call maybe modern day australia those people are the descendants of migrants yes indeed and let's not forget the uh the tasmanians who no longer are in existence, rising paradise to, to that lineage of the melanated family. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, it's heartbreaking to hear what, what, what they did to, 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 to those people on the island. Yeah. Absolutely mm-hmm. heartbreaking. And this, we're not talking like a thousand years ago. We're, we're talking a couple hundred years ago, these acts had taken place. 
yes yeah exactly who yeah. who gave the 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 authority to sell land who does the land be, belong to yeah i mean that's it's a, it's it's a good question isn't it because you know who who gave western europe the the, the power to say well this is how we're going to carve up the continent yeah how I, it, it's um where did these can, straight lines on the map appear marsha where did they come from <laughs> yeah exactly exactly it's a it's you know it's a very violent history very violent we are doing as much as we can do you're you're doing a lot more hands hands-on work than myself which is um very much uh, commendable and, and is um much thanks is given for that work and, and much success moving forward um as we, as we wind the bill down what what is the plans for the gregorian year of 2021 as it goes for the uh, the food bank and all that there so food bank is um is going to continue i think until we have you know until there's been until well until lockdown is 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 lifted and people have you know more opportunity to travel because it's not cheap you know and we mm. don't have always have the money um we have to continuously apply for funding and it it um so yeah we'll continue that for as long as we possibly can um and the work with the youth and um with education is i'm just going to continue to build on it as best as best as i can in the um in the circumstances are you getting much support from local businesses contributing produce etc or no we've had we've had uh none whatsoever none um that's very disheartening i thought based upon the righteous works that you're doing at least someone want, would like to have put their name and even if they're not putting their name to it actually just help silently oh, so, yeah we did have help i've got to take that back I got to take that back. I, I need to slap myself there. I'm getting tired, you know. It's mm, exactly, um, it's Friday. <laughs> local football club. Um, our local football club has actually been amazing, absolutely amazing. So I take it back. We got loads of support from our local football club. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. I, I'll um, see if I can reach out to some some people in in your vicinity. See if we can. Um make that happen because it, it's needed to be done it's needed to be done if you're if you, if you if you can see some good works within the community and you've got a business you should if you can i know in this climate of times depending what business you want it can be difficult but if you're in the um the retail grocery sort of food industry surely something can be done surely something yeah. that, that can be done yeah hopefully hopefully but yeah we did get support so i, I take that back um, good yeah we just haven't got um we haven't had tons we've had to do it quite a bit on our own but but we've managed we've done it so you're doing it man you're doing it that's the most important thing you're doing it you 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 it's gone from a um an idea a concept a thought and you've manifested it in the um, the physical realm. So you, in in the um, phraseology of the the five percent nation, you have shown and you have proved. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, man. It's it's good. It's good to know that you can, if you put your mind to something, you can, you can do something. And we we've also got quite a bit of funding to renovate the building um, to make it into a proper African Caribbean community center. We haven't had one in our area ever, so this will be the first one. Um, and again, that that started off as a an idea about two years ago. I sort of said, um, you know, if I'm going to leave the area, or um, I mean, I'm not saying I definitely, would, but I, I would like to have known that we created something for the community mm. that can be. Um, and we've we've been really successful with that. COVID held it up because we just you know we couldn't get the contractors in because you know they, they weren't working for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're hoping that by the end of this year that will be done. Give the thanks. Building. Give yeah. thanks. And trust me, you've got some reliable, good quality workmen, um, craftsmen, and 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 maintenance people on board. <clears throat> pardon self, who are not going to mess you around. Who are, whose word is bonds because I, I i do know from first-hand experience that the <laughs> tradesmen can be very um very challenging at times shall we say yeah i mean we, we're blessed actually because we do have some people in the community who um are engineers and architects so even Great. if they can't they can they're helping with 
seeing the project through and that we're getting the right information and mm -hmm. connecting to the right people. So we're actually blessed at that, but we've, we've used the skills that are in our community. This is it. Sometimes you got to keep it local. And, and as, as the acronym is, KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. Um, sis, have you had fun tonight? I have, you know, I've it's felt like I've just been talking to a friend. Um, not to say that you were an enemy or anything, but it has, it's felt like I've just been talking. So it's been a nice sort of reflective conversation because sometimes when I do uh when I do something online, like a podcast or something, you know, mm -hmm. it's quite set and a yes. little bit more rigid and I mm -hmm. have to be a little bit more on my toes as well particularly if you're going into um like a mainstream media one um Indeed. they'll they'll throw they'll throw a curveball at you you know particularly the other like it'll be like yeah 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 there is a problem with racism in policing but what about all this knife crime and you're like oh <laughs> <laughs> you said that you talk about racism in policing but now it's knife crime and, okay um, <laughs> so you just get that one thrown at you but um so no, it's been it's been a blessed um, conversation and discussion. I've really enjoyed it. Give thanks. I, oh, I, this is this is the whole objective. Each one teach twelve, uplift humanity, and let's just have a conversation. You know, based yes. upon this conversation, trustfully, you know, we're going to reach some people who may be in a situation where, you know, some some of the words that have been spoken um, may lead them to a a, a new outlook on life absolutely yeah yeah the only that thing would I, be exactly exactly um the only thing i can ask from anybody who who has listened or who will listen to this here is every day try and be the best version of yourself that you can be um it starts with self always starts with self before we can do anything to help anybody else We've got to help self. We've got to change self. We've got to recognize self. Let self out. Repress ego for a little bit. You know, keep that 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 in check a little. Some there's nothing wrong with having ego, but let the self come out. Experience this here life, and uh, trustfully we can um, cohabit this um, existence a little bit more happily. Mm -hmm. okay. And lastly, Marsha, what's the best place that um, the siblings and listeners can get hold of you? Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'm just going to give my Twitter handle because I, I go out of all social media. Twitter is the one that I connect with the most. OK. And then um, and my Twitter is open. So if people did want to like, speak to me specifically about anything that I've said or whatever, they could always send me a um a, a DM mm -hmm. and not a sliding in DMs. I'm just talking about it. <laughs> On a professional <laughs> level, of course, of course, I mean, Mademoiselle. Um, so my Twitter handle is at MCG1981. And that's all all together. MCG1981. And that's all you if you put in Marsha Garrett, I think that I, I think I do come up. I don't know how many of the Marsha Garrett. I was going to say that they'll put, you'll come up along with a whole load of other ones, but um, trust me, <laughs> as I, I will make sure in the description I will put a link below, um, mm. so people can come straight over to you if they haven't already subscribed or, or sorry, haven't already followed you. Please make sure you do uh, and check out this young lady's um, content and her cease and an element and a portion of her minds which she posts on the old tweeter mm -hmm. um let me ask you one last thing we've had a very enjoyable build conversation um it's been <laughs> very enlightening um tell me who you are but don't tell me your name <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I am no longer controlled by fear. Short and sweet. I love it. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. False evidence appearing real. Mm -hmm. We don't want any of that there. No fear. No fear. Definitely. Enjoyed it thoroughly. 
enjoyed it thoroughly, young lady. Um, comment below, like, share, all the rest of the good stuff. Tell a friend to tell a sister to tell a brethren to tune in. <laughs> and most definitely, thank yourself for tuning in and for surviving the zombie apocalypse of 2020. We made it. It's 2021 now. Let's see how we can uh, make this a, a better year moving forward. <laughs>